Today we're going to get into Unity's new experimental multiplayer play mode, which is awesome by the way, and build a system that will quickly take us through the Unity's lobby and relay services so that we can allow our players to access our multiplayer games from anywhere. While the code and topic of this video is not specific to any one game, we are going to implement it in the context of our ongoing multiplayer cart series. I hope you're looking forward to this packed episode. Let's get into it. Before we get started today, I want to give a quick shout out to one of the channel subscribers, Gary, who not only found a bug in the repository, but also suggested a great improvement as well. And I want to use this opportunity to extend an invitation to anyone else who's a subscriber of the channel. Anyone is welcome to suggest improvements to the code base at any time. So the two main Unity libraries that we're going to be using today are Lobby and Relay. So you need to go into your package manager and install both of those. I'll take a couple minutes each. And then once that's done, you need to make sure that your project is connected to Unity services. Now you can either go up into the left-hand side and sign in if you need to. Otherwise, you can just select your org and either create a new project ID or select one if you've already made one. Um, if you go over into authentication, you can actually get a link directly into the dashboard here. And you need to come in here and turn on these services. So jump into the multiplayer tab on the left here. And then you just jump into lobby and click on get started. And then there's just three little steps to go through. And because everything's already been done, the project has been linked now and the packages are installed. You basically just have to click through next, next and it gives you the opportunity to import some samples. So when you're done with the lobby, Relay is exactly the same. You'll get this success message in blue here once everything's set up, then you can jump over to the Relay tab and just click through again, exactly the same thing. When you're done with that, let's jump back into the project and let's quickly make a scene here. I'm just gonna call my new scene Lobby and Let's make sure that it's in the build settings at the very top of the list. I'll just drag it in there and actually just drag it up here. And yeah, that's it. Now I wanna talk about multiplayer mode for a moment because I'm gonna be using it for the rest of this video. This is a new feature in Unity 2023 and it's experimental still. It has some bugs, which I'll talk about as we go along. And while this part is totally optional, you don't have to upgrade your project and you don't have to install this part. Believe me when I say this is one of the best things I've ever seen as far as multiplayer tools in Unity goes. This is going to make your life so much easier. I'm just going to quickly talk about how I upgraded my local version of the project. So I installed the new version of 2023 beta. The next thing I did was just created a totally empty project and imported all the dependencies at the version that 2023 expects. Then I opened up the manifest file and that's in your slash packages folder. It's just a text file that shows all the dependencies. The relay and the lobby that we're using, those versions haven't changed, but some other things have. Um, Netcode for game objects has a newer version, which we can use because there's no breaking changes. Uh, you can see I've already listed my multiplayer play mode in here. Then I copied that package back to my original project, changed the version in Unity Hub and opened it up. Took a few minutes to compile and the only thing it complained about was some Text Mesh Pro stuff because I had deleted some folders in my local. Now, if you don't need to upgrade your project because you're watching this video in the future sometime and you've just cloned it from the repository or whatever, or you're starting it at some point other than the very beginning, you can also install the package just by going up to the package manager at the plus icon and you can type in the name of the package. And the version at the time we're recording this is 0.4.0. And that takes a moment to install. And then if you look here under window, we now have a new window we can open called multiplayer mode. And let's have a closer look at this and what it can do. I'm just gonna dock mine right up by the hierarchy. Now you can see you can have up to four different players at one time, including your main editor. I'm gonna enable one of them. And while that's activating, I'm gonna set up a couple tags. Now you can reference uh, all the tags in code if you need to. For now, I'll just make one for the host and one for the client. And then when player two is done activating, let's just give it a playthrough and we'll see how it works. 
So once I've got player two active, Unity actually opens up this little extra window and it would be the same for player three and player four. So let's, uh, in this version here, I've already clicked play in the editor, so I can come in here as the host. And now we've got the game running locally here. I'll just park the card over here and come back to the editor and come in as the client. So uh, by doing this, you can see that I basically jumped through all the hoops of requiring extra consoles in the editor. We don't need anything like Peril Sync anymore. You see you've got a console right at the bottom of each of these little windows. So you can see all your debug. You can see in there which one you know started the host, one the other one started the client. Uh, this is great for debugging and it's going to be great going forward with any multiplayer games we build, not just the one today. So I hope that if you feel up to upgrading your project up to the new beta version of Unity, I think that you'll find this is worthwhile. I'm just going to bring this diagram up on the screen really quick because some people might find it useful uh, instead of staring at a big wall of code. Basically, everybody has to authenticate. Then the host has to go through the steps that are required to create the lobby and get a relay allocation and a code for it, and then start the game as the host. Clients simply need to quick join a lobby, get the relay code from that lobby, and then get an allocation for the relay, and then they start the game as a client. And that's the general gist of things. Our goal today is to get people through the lobby and relay services and into the game so that people can play from anywhere. So back in our main game scene, we actually don't need this network start UI anymore, so I'm going to delete it. And we need to move the network manager to be inside of our first scene that we ever load, and that's going to be the lobby scene. So I'm just going to copy it, come over to the lobby, paste it in there. And once it's in the lobby scene, we can go back to the main scene and just remove it. And we'll save up this main scene and... That's it for those kinds of changes. Now we can jump back into the lobby, come over to the network manager and make sure that enable scene management is checked. That's all the setup we have to do for now. Let's start making a new script. Now I made a new folder in here called lobby and I'm just going to call this first script multiplayer and it's going to be a singleton that will manage all things having to do with us authenticating and going through the relay and lobby services. Let's expose a few fields to the editor. First of all, lobby name, I'll just put lobby in here, and max players, again, we might want to change that. And like I said, this is going to be a singleton, so let's have an instance variable here that we can have access to. We're also going to have a reference to whatever lobby we decide to create. Now, we need a start method. We'll assign this to the singleton instance, and we need to not destroy this on load. We want this service to go through any scene changes that we have. So let's have all of our authentication in its own asynchronous method. So first of all, let's suppose the player hasn't specified a name or we haven't passed one in. Let's overload this method and pass in a made up player name with a random number on the end. Then we'll have a version of that method which accepts a string for player name. Now, what we wanna do is if the initialization state is uninitialized, then we want to create a new instance of the options and we want to set the profile to be this unique player name. And this is important for the multiplayer services. Each of those little windows needs a unique profile. And then we can call the Unity services initialize async method and that gets the services started up. Next, let's hook into the signed in delegate just so when someone signs in, we can show that they actually got a unique player ID and we'll get a little confirmation in the editor. Finally, if we're not signed in, let's call the signed in anonymously async method. And then I think we should store the player ID and the player name into properties. We might want to have access to those at some point in the future. Okay, now that we're all authenticated, we can write all of our methods to handle relay. And the relay methods are all going to be private because we're going to be calling them from our two public methods that are either going to start the game as a host or a client. So the first one is to actually make a relay allocation. So the first thing we'll do is in a try catch block, let's call the relay service instance and create an allocation async. And when you pass the number of players in here, make sure it's minus one because it doesn't count the host. Now we'll just catch an exception here if anything goes awry and I'll put in a message. We do need a return value, so let's just return a default. This line wrap's gonna bother me, so I'm gonna delete that comment. Next up, 
we need to actually get the relay join code after we have an allocation. So let's pass in the allocation and in another try catch block, let's grab that code. We're just going to reach into the instance again and use the get join code async method. Once we have that, we can return it. If we fail, message return default. Now those two methods are used by the host, but for clients, they're going to actually just need to join the relay. We just call the join allocation async method, pass in the code. Wow, Copilot guessed the whole thing, not bad. That will return a join allocation, not to be confused with a normal allocation. Let's come back up to the top and define our two public methods. Now, the one is going to be for the person actually creating the game. So we'll call that one create lobby. And the other one will be for people who are going to join the game. We'll just call it quick join lobby. I'll just write out the basic try catch framework here, and then we'll go through them one at a time. So in order to create our lobby, first we're going to start accessing these relay methods. So let's get an allocation using our allocate relay method. Then we'll get the join code by passing that allocation into the next method. And then we can set some options. Now here, there's a lot of options you can send in, but right now we just want to make sure that it's a public lobby. So once that's ready, we can actually create the lobby. We'll pass in the lobby name, max players, and the options. And then let's just debug something saying that we actually created the lobby. And once we have a lobby created, we can start polling it. We can send it a heartbeat every so often to keep it alive. And every so often, on a little longer interval, we can actually poll it for updates. Now we already have a countdown timer class in our utilities, so let's just make use of that. We'll define two timers for that, and as soon as we've created the lobby, we can start running them. But I'm just going to move them up to the top, and then in the start method, we can actually define what's going to happen with them. We should also define their intervals with constants here, so the heartbeat can be 20 seconds. The lobby poll interval should be greater than 60 seconds. And then in start method, let's hook into the events in these timers so that they restart themselves as soon as they finish. So when each of these timers stops, we want to handle whatever it's in charge of and then start it again. So the first one, let's make a method to handle the heartbeat async. The other one, let's handle the polling. Copilot again almost has this Totally right, I just said the method name wrong. Send heartbeat ping async. And the other one is get lobby async. Now these are kind of helper methods, so I'm going to move them to the bottom of the class. And then I can see uh, lobby ID, that should actually be ID, current lobby dot ID. Yeah, and then we have our two timers running and they'll just run indefinitely. So now that we have the lobby created, we need to add our relay code to it so that other joiners will be able to grab it from the lobby and join our relay. So that requires an update lobby options and that just takes in some data in the form of a dictionary that is string and data object. The key for join code is a string. So let's define that as a constant up at the top here. It's just called relay join code. What that's saying is we want all members to be able to access that join code. In the network manager, we can now set the relay server data. So that requires the allocation and it requires a connection type. Connection type is the name of the variable, but it's really specifying encryption. Now that is, again is a string value. So let's go up to the top of the class and actually turn this into an enum that we can use. We don't have to type in strings all over the place. I'm just gonna scroll back up to the top here and we'll define an enum with the different encryption types we might want to use. So DTLS you'll wanna use for most of your builds, but if you wanna do a WebGL build, you can end up using the WSS one, but there are a couple others. Now let's have two constants that actually define what these string values are that we pass in. Then using that, we can expose one of these encryption types to the editor and we can make choices that way. Then let's just have a private string here. For now, we can just use a little ternary operator because we only have two. Otherwise you might wanna turn that into a switch. Okay, well that solves our encryption problem there. Now we're almost finished. 
All we have to do is actually start the host. And that's actually the most complicated method. The quick join lobby method by comparison is very simple. All we have to do is just call this quick join lobby async method. Once we've actually joined the lobby, let's start polling for updates. We can then grab the relay join code out of that lobby, and then we can join the relay using the code. Now we need to also again set the relay server data, but this time we're passing in the join allocation in the encryption. Then all we have to do is start the client. Well, how about that? We're almost code complete. Now, coming back over to the editor, I made a little prefab that I'm going to leave in the repository or you can make your own, but it's just uh, two buttons and a background that will uh, we'll hook up to creating the game and joining the game. And maybe we can make that background a little more exciting than that. We also need an empty game object here to hold our multiplayer script. So let's have a look at that quickly. You can see we can choose the encryption type. Let's change the lobby name to cart lobby. And then despite the fact that I dragged this UI prefab in here that has a canvas on it, there is no event system here. So let's add an event system into the scene. Don't forget about that or you'll be wondering why your buttons don't work. I don't like passing around scene names as strings. So we're gonna bring in this open source library that we've used in the past. And I'll have a link to that in the description. That allows us to pass scenes by reference. So let's come back into code here and let's start writing a lobby UI script. I'm just going to move this into its own class here. Now the lobby UI, we just need references to the buttons and we need a reference to the scene that this particular UI is going to want to send us to after someone takes an action. So we'll get a scene reference in there and using the uh, open source library. Now on awake, let's attach listeners to these two buttons. We'll just put them as methods because they're going to be async. So the first one, we'll just call it create game and that'll call our multiplayer instance and we'll create the lobby. Now the other one is just to join. We'll call the other public method. Now the host has to be the one that changes the scenes, not the clients. So we'll make a loader class, just a static class that we can use to load network scenes. Let's have a public method there, a public static method to load a network scene. We'll pass in a scene reference and that needs to call the network manager singleton scene manager load scene, pass in the scene name and we're going to load this scene, not additively, just one single scene. And we'll move that into its own class. And now we're done writing code. If we come back into the editor, we can attach that lobby UI script to our lobby UI object, drag in references to the buttons, and then go find our game scene in the scenes and drag that reference in there. That's all we have to do. Now let's have a play and look at the logs and see what it's happening. All right, so as soon as I hit play, you can see I've connected and it's giving me my own unique ID here. Now I'm gonna click create and you'll see it starts looking for a region because we haven't specified one. So it looks like it checked 15 different servers for the most optimal one. Then you can see it's created our lobby with a join code. So that looks great. I'll just drive this card out of the way a little bit and then I'll grab that other window. So you can see here, it's also signed me in as soon as I press play in the editor with a different unique ID. And as soon as I click join, sure enough, throws me right into this same gameplay instance as the host. So that's great. Everything is working just as we expected. I want to say one thing about errors with multiplayer play mode, and that is I've seen quite a few strange bugs. If you start seeing errors like what I've captured on the screen here, or potentially you just can't connect to the relay for some reason, it usually means that something's gone awry with the state within these little containers. And that's kind of to be expected because this is still an experimental package. So what I've found is if I get into these kinds of problems and it's preventing me from using it, all I do is shut down the editor and start it again. It only takes a minute and everything's back to normal. It just resets the state of all of them. All right, that's going to be the end of today's episode. If you like this kind of content or you learned something new today, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss any future episodes. Next week, we're going to focus on gameplay mechanics, try and wrap up any loose ends to this vertical slice. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the comments below.